Well, hey everybody, it's Sandy and welcome to my channel dedicated to helping you advocate for your own health one topic at a time. So today I have something really special to talk about because I'm not going to make my normal disclaimer. My usual disclaimer is I'm not giving out any individual medical advice on this channel. But today I have something to present to you that I think I can safely recommend to anybody. Um, it is risk-free, and if you are a practitioner, if you're a physician, a nurse practitioner, if you are a nurse at the bedside, an LPN, you can recommend this to your patients, um, and that is meditation. Don't get scared, okay? Doesn't mean you got to be um, out with your feet over your thighs in the Himalayas with your fingers out like this. Uh, people get a little bit scared when they hear terms like meditation, um, but there is actually mounting evidence that meditation has many health benefits, both physical and um, mental. And I think it's starting to enjoy some widespread acceptance, sort of similar to intermittent fasting, which used to be relegated to rather a, a fringe status um, and is now beginning to um, enjoy some legitimacy uh, in clinical circles. And I think the whole mind-body medicine is kind of on the verge there also of enjoying widespread acceptance in um, our clinical practices. So um, meditation is actually an umbrella term. It, it, it can mean many different things. There's many different ways to meditate and to enhance that mind-body connection. Um, my experience is that I actually learned, you know, a technique of meditation many years ago. I was like in my 20s. I guess I felt like it was uh, helpful, but like most 20-something year olds, I quickly stopped doing it. Um, and I didn't really pick it up again until uh, about two and a half years ago. So I stumbled upon a documentary called The Connection. And I'm going to link it down below in the description box. And by the way, anything I link below that can be purchased, I have no uh, relationship and I'm not doing any kind of affiliate links. I'm not going to make any kind of commissions on anything I recommend. So you have my objective um, endorsement uh, of whatever I put down there. So The Connection is a documentary that was produced by a young journalist who struggled with her own, I think, autoimmune disease. She didn't really go into any detail about it, but it sounded from what I could piece together in my own experience and clinical work is that it sounded like it was some kind of an autoimmune connective tissue disease, which would be something like rheumatoid arthritis or maybe lupus. And she decided that she was going to start to explore the mind-body medicine and integrative approach and see how much she could help herself with that. Now, I am never going to refer to anything as alternative, okay? So integrative, alternative, very different terms. Um, alternative sort of sounds like instead of, right? So I'm not ever going to recommend anybody do anything instead of their prescribed medical care. Um, integrating means more like things can help augment one another. And um, one thing I really liked about this documentary called The Connection is that the people that she interviewed and um, relied on for the scientific expertise were physicians who were sort of pioneers in this field and they did not disregard the science. So um, people like uh, Dr. Herbert Benson, um, Herbert Benson is the founder of the Mind Body Medical Institute of the Massachusetts General Hospital, that's Harvard. He's also a medical professor at Harvard Medical School. And um, he's been around a long time, so he was one of the pioneers of this field. And back in 1975, he published a book after he had um, done a great deal of research in his own clinical practice, and he had been able to teach patients to actually reduce their own blood pressures by teaching them to elicit what he called the relaxation response. So what he called the relaxation response is a term he coined, and it is um, sort of the opposite of the stress response, which is sort of fight or flight. And he basically taught pa patients how to elicit something called the relaxation response and lower their own blood pressures. He did have some patients um, come down on or come off of blood pressure medications. Again, I'm not recommending anybody do that without some medical oversight. Um, but it's really interesting because that was back in 1975. So this has been kind of a long time coming. Um, anyway, he was one of the contributors to The Connection. Um, also was uh, Andrew Wheel, who was a physician. He graduated from Harvard Medical School and he has founded um, the specialty called Integrative Medicine. He has 
uh, a residency program, I think somewhere in Arizona, where um, physicians and nurse practitioners can go and um, learn all about integrative medicine. Um, so there were any number of other experts from around the country and actually around the world who were interviewed in the connection. And the other thing that really struck me was some of the examples that they gave that were so persuasive using scientific technique um, that we didn't have just, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, so I'm just going to go through a, a couple of highlights and I'm just going to recommend that you watch that video and there's no sense in me reinventing the wheel. But um, as an overall practice, it seems that meditation has a lot of advantages over many different systems and many different kinds of disease states. So it can help with brain and immune health. It can help reduce cardiovascular risk. It can help with chronic pain, with sleep disorders, with anxiety, and there's even some emerging medical evidence that it can augment um, medical therapy um, for various conditions. So I'm just gonna hit some of the highlights here for it as examples. Um, one of the examples that was given in the connection that was discussed um, used uh, imaging and uh, looked at the amygdala. So the amygdala is a little cluster of neurons or nerve cells deep inside the brain. It's in part of the limbic system and it deals with uh, processing uh, emotion. And the amygdala, when a person is subjected to great stress, will actually become enlarged and it doesn't seem that it goes back down to its normal size on its own. So even in um, mice or rats, I don't remember which one, uh, there was a study that was done where they were subjected to great stress. I don't know what kind and I don't wanna know, nobody asked. Um, but anyway, they were subjected um, over a period of time to stress and there was imaging studies done on the brain that watched as the amygdala would enlarge and it would continue to enlarge and then at some point the stress was withdrawn. And after that, the amygdala stopped enlarging, but it never shrunk back. So subsequent to that, there was another study that was done on humans and showed that in an eight-week course of uh, mindfulness meditation, that the amygdala will begin to shrink. And I thought to myself, you know, how empowering that sounds because, you know, you keep hearing things like, well, you've got to reduce stress in your life. I hear people say that all the time. I need to get rid of the stress. And I've always thought that that actually sounds kind of, I don't know, that's a little immature and unrealistic, I think, right? I mean, if you're lucky enough to have a full life, I'm very blessed. I've got a, you know, a good career. I own a home. I've raised kids. I have a marriage. I have a dog. I, I mean, I have, you know things that I do out in my community, of course I'm gonna encounter some stress. So if I'm on my way to work tomorrow and I roll out of the out of the garage and I realize I've got a flat tire and I'm supposed to be in the operating room in about 20 minutes, I'm, I'm gonna be pretty stressed, yeah. So, but you know, a study like this that showed that you can use the mindfulness, mindfulness meditation to shrink the amygdala. So in other words, to start to eradicate that stress has caused you, how empowering is that? That It's just a whole lot more realistic to me to, to say, I wanna find some way to mitigate the damage or to prevent any damage that might be caused by the stress that is inevitably gonna be there because I'm not gonna get rid of the stress. So I just thought that was a really interesting thing and it, it gave me an opportunity to kind of look at stress in a different way than I ever had. Um, Another one of the studies that they talked about in this video dealt with a medical therapy for an autoimmune disease in the skin. And in this case, um, dermatologists at Harvard got together with um, Dr. Benson, who I mentioned a moment ago, and they were looking at a light therapy that is done for um, patients who have a certain autoimmune condition where they sit under a light for some period of time and you know whatever the result is I'm sure there's a bell curve as some people respond well some people don't and they talked about this and they decided to um, take some of the patients with this particular diagnosis and divide them into two groups and um, the patients in one group would receive the therapy just as normal and the other group of patients would be taught the technique of meditation and they were instructed then to meditate while receiving their light treatment and what they found is a four-fold increase in response to the treatment. I'm gonna say that again, four-fold. So if let's say only 20% of people typically respond well to this treatment, that means it would have been 80%. Okay, I don't know what the numbers actually were, but 
fourfold is astounding. And so surprising was this uh, result that they decided that it was probably just a fluke and that they should repeat this on a much larger scale. And they went ahead and they repeated the study with a much larger group of patients and they found exactly the same result. So again, I thought to myself, how empowering, not only you know, for people for themselves, but for healthcare providers, you know, it's so simple to offer something that is risk-free, might help, um, certainly isn't going to hurt, and probably is going to help in some way or another, um, but that it might actually help to augment a medical therapy. How much place is there for, for that kind of a practice? I mean, it, the possibilities, it seems to me, are endless. Um, when I think about all the patients I see who are on various medications, and some of them, you know, they're not risk-free, and some of them we say, oh, we know that largely this is a placebo effect, but so what? But, you know, and then some years later, we find out, well, actually, there were some risks that we didn't understand. I mean, that, that doesn't happen with meditation. So I just think this has so much... Um, possibility. So how did I get started with meditation? Meditation is an umbrella term, and I'm not going to really get into all the different kinds of meditation, but just suffice it to say there are many. So some, um, there's mindfulness meditation, there's Tai Chi, there's actually yoga. Yoga will elicit that same response in the brain. Um, now, there are is a finite number of things you can do to get this response. And um, by that, I mean some people will say, well, I'm not really into that, but I, um, I like knitting, or I like reading, or I'm, I'm a runner, so running is my thing. And, and I'm not knocking any of those things. I'm sure that uh, any number of those things, if you derive some pleasure and some benefit from them, and they're not harmful to you, they might have any number of benefits. But they're not going to be the same as the benefit of meditation. So how do we know that? Again, back to the imaging studies, um, the people who study the impact of meditation on humans have learned now that the benefit comes from a shutting down of various centers in the brain. So when you meditate, um, there are all sorts of areas in the brain that you're not using at that time that begin to shut down and they quiet down. And that only happens with certain activities. Apparently yoga does elicit that response, meditation, some forms of prayer, Apparently, um, Dr. Benson talks about this, that prayer satisfies the criteria because some of these, the criteria in any of these activities is that there is a repetition about it and that there is an active disregard for any kinds of distractions that might come into play. I don't have any experience myself with using prayer this way, so I, I can't really talk about that, um, although I don't doubt it. Um, I started with a mindfulness meditation, and I think this topic again is is large and it's more than one video but so i'll just sort of introduce the concept of mindfulness meditation and then the tool that i use to get started the teaching tool um, but mindfulness is about focusing on just one thing and typically people start learning with the breath so they'll start focusing on their breath and not try to control it maybe at first take a couple of deep breaths so you get the feeling of it and then try to quiet down and just let it happen on its own like it will if you're not even focusing on it and just being able to watch it. So I have read that because the breath and blinking are the only two processes in the body that are both conscious and unconscious, that watching your breath as a witness and being able to sort of focus on it for some period of time without actually exerting any control over it, it's kind of giving you a glimpse into the unconscious process. Okay. I can't say I've really noticed that, or if I have, I'm not like really even aware of it, but I can say that I have noticed many of the benefits that I have read that med that meditation can produce. So um, better sleep, uh, decreased anxiety, lower blood pressure, um, a, more of a positive outlook on life. Um, I sort of liken meditation to, like I said earlier, intermittent fasting, whereas intermittent fasting is something I can physically do that will help to reset um, and enhance my immune response and my body's repair mechanisms. And I sort of think that that's what meditation is doing for the mind. And obviously the mind and the body are connected. Um, so I started with mindfulness meditation where I learned to focus on my breathing. 
I now do other things as well. I've done yoga for years. I never really recognized its meditative potential until after I learned about meditation. Um, I do dabble a little bit in Tai Chi, and I've even done a water, an aqua Tai Chi, which I, I like very much. Um, I started with a tool with a particular video to learn how to meditate. There's so many of them out there, and honestly, I think so much, of, so many of these are just garbage. Um, so I'm going to link down below the one, there's probably an Amazon link I'll put down there to um, a beginner's meditation. Um, I find that if I do it first thing in the morning, it's really helpful. If I have to be in the operating room early in the morning, then it gets shifted and I meditate more toward um, dusk, I guess, at the end of the day. It's kind of a signaling of a relaxation time. Um, I will also say that I recommend that you decide to commit to a period of time. So when I started this, it was a little over two and a half years ago now. I can't even believe that. I started with a three-month period. So I put a day on my calendar and I actually made a note to myself and I said, starting daily meditation practice. And I had it remind me in three months when that was up. So I decided I was just gonna try this for three months. So that was like two and a half years ago. I'm still doing it. Um, I think that's, I have the three month period to thank largely for that because I think that three months is long enough that it can really become habituated and you can start to see some benefit. I think the benefits of meditation that you can actually see yourself are um, kind of subtle and take a while. I don't, they don't really happen overnight. Um, and I think that anytime sooner than three months, it's just too early to quit and just completely forget about it. It's sort of like that that law of inertia, like things at rest tend to stay at rest and things in motion tend to stay in motion. And I kind of think that when you get to that three month mark, you're, you're sort of in motion at that point. And it was just real easy for me to keep going. Um, I will say that I've enhanced it. I've honed it kind of like when I've talked about with intermittent fasting, there's no one thing that's going to fix everything for you. And there's no one thing you're going to learn one time and never change it. So I have, um, changed the way I meditate over time. I've I've gotten better at it. It's not something you're gonna feel like you're really good at right away. I think I would do it for a very short period, like a five minute period when I first get started and not try to meditate for 20 minutes. Um, and then there are days when you'll have good days and you'll have bad days and you'll have days where you can't seem to get rid of the distractions. And then the next day you'll feel like you meditated really well. And it's only after you've done it for quite some time that I think you can look back um, with a bird's eye view and just have this basis for comparison and see some progress. So um, I think that's all I have for now. I would love to elaborate on this topic if people find it interesting. Um, I would really like to hear some feedback from nurses. I, I think that this could be a tremendous tool also for nurses. Um, nursing is one of the most stressful professions in the world. I think it's like nurses are just expected to do more and more and more and more all the time. And it just seems like um, I, I just, Maybe it's just because I see, I work, I'm, I'm a kind of a nurse, but I work with bedside nurses all the time. And I, I just haven't seen people really as stressed as I've, I've seen nurses on a daily basis. And I think that this might be an incredible tool for helping them to care for their patients um, by caring for themselves. So I'd love to hear your feedback and um, please subscribe and please share this video with anyone you think might be interested. And until next time, thanks. Bye-bye.